Okay. So let me um, let me propose something and see if you um, ultimately agree with me or shoot me down. So let me show you a trauma patient. On the left hand side is the usual trauma. He's got lots of rib fractures, pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema. And I'm not going to show it exactly in order, but close. Um, the time between the two exams here is as you see there. So in between, you obviously had devices placed in chest tubes. And I'll give you a minute to look at that and appreciate the change on the right compared to the left. So let me make this one just big for a moment and take a look at the appearance of the right lung, which is the item of interest, and see if you would diagnose anything or whether the appearance of it rings a bell, maybe. So obviously I've got a theory in mind yes, so I'll show you. So let me do this now. And I'm going to, not to uh, measure anything as such, but let me just draw something, something like this. I'll just leave it at that for a moment on that side. And then I'll go up here and bring this there. So what I'm trying to show is there is an opacity that has that shape, which on this projection huh. is the elephant ear. So let me now make that go away and I'll take away the red stuff I put on there. So what I'm trying to diagnose here is at this point in time, the presence of right upper and right middle lobe collapse. The rest of the lung here being the right lower lobe. So of course that combination of right upper and right middle would be unusual because the bronchus intermedius is spared. So when you see descriptions of that, usually they say the one bronchial obstruction might be a mass, but the other one is something different, for example, secretions or something. So let me just go and show you that here's a CT that was done not too long after admission. And at this time here, let me make this a bit bigger. Um, take a look at the extent of atelectasis. So here, for example, we have quite a bit of secretions or something or aspirated material, posterior segment right up the lobe there. And then when we go down here, we see substantial atelectasis involving the right lower and middle lobes, the middle lobe being down here at that time. So a lot of atelectasis is present then on the 30th. So let me go now, bring up some additional images here. Um, the lungs better aerated, but we still have this opacity up here. Okay. And let me go forward in time now to show you that that opacity up there stayed. So for example, here it is here. So now the time between these is quite a few days, but this opacity up here remains. And you might think that that is right upper lobe atelectasis or some atelectasis in the right upper lobe, but it is not. I hope to convince you that it is not. So now I'm going to show you, this is the seventh, this radiograph on the left. And let me bring in a coronal image from the ninth. And let me bring in a sagittal image from that time as well. And let's go and let me show you that if we go to the frontal projection, you can see that here is that atelectatic lung. And here is a chest tube that's probably at least in part in the fissure. Now you might think that's right up below, but it is not. So let me make that bigger. If we follow the bronchial tree, there's some atelectasis in the upper lobe up here. Um, here is the middle lobe bronchus. And here is some air in medial lateral segmental airways, but otherwise that's the atelectatic right middle lobe that's up there. 
and the aerated or hyperexpanded right lower lobes down here. And if we do this for the lateral projection, so for example, if I go here, and just in terms of orientation, I'm going to click on that. So here is the middle lobe up here. Here is the middle lobe that's atelectatic, some air in it. Here's upper lobe, here's quite a bit of atelectasis in the posterior segment. And this is all the overexpanded, particularly the anterior basal segments of the right lower lobe right there. So the findings going forward in time, I like to think support the notion that first this is right middle lobe atelectasis. And then what I showed you there initially go, to go back is the elephant ear sign of right upper and middle lobe atelectasis and the hyper expanded right lower lobe. So are you convinced? What do you think about that theory? I, that's a good theory. I'm, 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 just, I'm still, I'm, the only thing that puzzles me, Howard, on the, the initial radiograph is what is that interface that, um, where the two pleural drains cross the aerated lung from the non-aerated lung? I guess that's just a rotated major fissure. But I think these are the interlobar fissures. So for example, you know, going forward in time, if you think about where the fissures are, mm -hmm. we have one fissure here um, and one fissure up here. So here's the lower lobe. So this is a major fissure that okay. goes like this in here. Whereas this one up here is the minor fissure up I there. See. I see. So that so that at that time we have a combination of two fissures as well but between the ov expanded right lower lobe and the atelectatic right middle and atelectatic right upper is what i'm trying to postulate here got it so let me bring back this one for example now at this point in time don't know why that happened uh, notice that we have two fissures, right? So the upper one up here is the minor fissure. And then when we go over here, this is the major fissure here. And I think a similar phenomenon was present here at this time as well. One fissure being the major, one fissure being the minor. Because otherwise this looks like an elephant here. It looks like the elephant here sign and there's clearly an interlobar fissure between this opacity and aerated lung yeah. and between this opacity and aerated lung here. These are clearly interlobar fissures, right? Yes, for sure. Interesting. So um, I don't think I've seen this before. I, obviously I'd heard about the elephant ear sign, but I think that um, how much you see depends on how much atelectasis involves those lobes. But to me, this does look like something of an elephant ear in that sense. If there's another explanation for this complex of findings, I don't know what it is at that time. Any ideas? I'll go into the next one. Anything else or something about this that can't be what I'm describing? What does Sounds reasonable. I like the elephant here. That's nice. Because usually, of course, you know, all the time we were describing this right up below bad electricity here. But it isn't. I showed you. That's <clears throat> low, but middle lobe is up there. Yeah. I think, the, I think this what, one. what's making the what makes this case uh, unusual, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that this is um, middle lobe plus upper lobe atelectasis and it's it's strange because normally the middle lobe is going to stay anterior but because of the large pneumothorax in this case yeah everything is sort of flopped posteriorly and then i think it got stuck there so the middle lobe is surprisingly posterior in this case that, uh, on some of the lateral views and it's probably because it all, all things with pneumothorax and also, I think in some point in time, the right lower lobe expanded a lot because this is all right lower lobe, filled the space where the right middle lobe is. So the right middle lobe can't, in a sense, fall down back to where we usually see it. For example, this image here, this is all right lower lobe. Mm -hmm. And here's the middle lobe sitting in there. I think, you know, you can see the bronchi and the middle lobe bronchus going right to the medial and lateral segmental bronchi. And then you can see all of these are right lower lobe bronchi down here. 
filling in the rest of the space of the chest here, right? Okay, let me show you another interesting case of atelectasis. So I saw this um, in a patient as an incidental finding. So here I will start and show you this. Um, let me just get to where I saw the patient. So when I saw the patient, it's on this side. So at this time, there is this opacity here on the frontal projection of the chest. And it's clearly new from a prior. And let me bring in the corresponding lateral projection, which is this right here. So we see this and we see this. Now, this is an opacity that involves the superior and lateral portion of the right middle lobe. But by appearance and location, it's not typical of complete right middle lobe atelectasis. But by location and appearance, it's very consistent with atelectasis involving just the lateral segment of the right middle lobe. So let me bring in just this other lateral that shows you that the apex of the triangle here projects a little bit posterior to the right pulmonary artery. And notice that unlike the usual base of the triangle of the right middle lobe, which starts anteriorly, this part is normal. And the triangular or the opacity starts more posterior than usual. So let me show you a nice picture from a really classic um, article by Anthony Proto and Irena Tosino on lobar atelectasis. And they're making a distinction between up here, atelectasis that involves the medial segment of the right middle lobe versus atelectasis here in C and D that involves the lateral segment of the right middle lobe. Notice just like this case, the apex of the resultant triangle projects a little posterior to the right pulmonary artery. And the opacity of it also um, contacts the minor fissure, whereas the opacity of a medial segment right middle lobe, number one, doesn't contact the minor fissure and the base of the triangles here, and it doesn't go posterior to the hilum, right? So if you guys buy that, then there's this, and this is the same as what I'm showing you for the case that I have. And then over time, that's just spontaneously when it got better. So I presume it was mucus or something, because this is a follow-up radiograph just the next month showing you that disappeared. So I think this is a nice example of lateral segment, right middle lobe atelectasis, the medial segment being spared. What do you think? Looks good. Do you like that? I do. Here's the, here again is that picture. Uh, for those of you who know, I don't have that. I thought I had the whole PDF of that whole article, but I just made a picture of, of that. See these lines down here? This is me, 1980, first year resident, reading this. I don't know why I did that when I was a student, underlined stuff when I was reading. But that's uh, that's an article from 19, 1980 from the Green Journal, the seminars in radiology that I remembered. Okay, I've got other cases, but I've done enough so I can show more if you need to. Okay, thank you, Howard. All right, who's up next? I can show a couple. All right, David. Let's see here. <clears throat> People see a rentgenogram. I do. So this person has a bullet. It looks like about a 45 caliber or a nine millimeter size bullet floating around in the chest here and person doesn't have any chest symptoms at this point. Uh, this is an outside radiograph from Alaska where this person was seen. So the question is, um, where did the bullet come from? The person was not shot in the chest. And this is in a proximal lower lobe pulmonary artery. So it's um, 
bullet embolism. If we go back to this um, CT scan again from the from the Alaska place where this per person was shot, um, and we followed up, we can see where this where the bullet entered down here. So the person was hit in the flank back here, and notice the swelling of the psoas muscle here. There's a hematoma in the psoas muscle. As we go a little higher up, we can see that there was some um, damage to the vertebral body at this point. So the bullet is sort of moving obliquely upward. And I think the bullet ended up in the liver, having perhaps gone through the inferior vena cava, probably in the liver, because I think this is a little bit of edema around the cava here. You couldn't really see any caval disruption, but I presume that the bullet got into the cava probably in the liver, given that there is this abnormality near the cava in the liver, and then um, traveled from there into the lung circulation and was lodged here in a left lower pulmonary artery. So this is a case of bullet embolism, uh, which was a big surprise to the internists around here because they don't, they don't see trauma um, the way the Harborview um, surgeons do. So bullet embolism here, taking a long course through the body and ending up in a left pulmonary artery. And this had to be removed with an open procedure. The bullet evidently uh, led to some thrombosis of uh, left lower lobe pulmonary arteries. It was pretty much wedged in there, so they had to actually go in and massage the lung and sort of push the bullet back into the circulation where they could remove it from a more proximal arteriotomy. So this required an open, open procedure to retrieve from the left pulmonary artery. So it should have been a Harborview case. I think it actually was a Harborview case. It was flown in from, from Alaska to Harborview for treatment. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> speaking of trauma, this woman has back pain and was treated by her acupuncturist the day before and the needles were placed along her spine, mostly lumbar spine and sacrum, and she had some cupping uh, with, and there was a bruise visible near her sacrum on one side where they had applied the, the cup and, you know, generated a vacuum and then um, sucked the skin up into the, into the cup and caused a little bruising. But she had needles placed, mostly lumbar, but there were two thoracic needles placed on the right there was lower thoracic and then there was upper thoracic. And during the placement of the lower thoracic needle, she experienced sensations of something weird was going on and then it, then it became a sharp chest pain. And the acupuncturist thought that this meant that she needed more therapy and the recommendation at the time um, of this was you should come back for more acupuncture. But instead, the next day she came to the emergency room and has this large right pneumothorax. Um, she was treated with tube thoracostomy and uh, the pneumothorax got better and she went home a couple of days later. So this is a acupuncture induced pneumothorax and there are case reports of such things. The needles are supposed to be superficial, uh, but if they go too deep, you know, there's not, and she's a slender person here, there's not all that much space between the skin surface and the pleural space if you're, if you're not obese in certain of these locations. So acupuncture-induced pneumothorax. So I looked at some other cases I had of, um, of acupuncture needles. And here is a, here's a case from several years ago with all of these very fine fragments here of acupuncture needles in the upper thorax. And on lateral view, you can see that these are posterior here in the posterior chest wall. So these are acupuncture needles. There are different styles of acupuncture. Sometimes the needles are placed and are rotated or stimulated for a while. Sometimes they actually connect them to uh, an electrical source and put some electricity in them. Sometimes they heat them. All these things designed to stimulate. And sometimes they actually have a very thin portion near the tip that they break off and leave in place. And I believe that with the, the fineness of these needles here indicates that they were probably designed to be left in place. So some of the acupuncture needles are, are retained and show up as these interesting foreign bodies on subsequent chest radiographs. And, um, you know, I could show you the CT on this, but it doesn't really add anything. Here's another case of small needles here above the right clavicle. Again, very fine needles that have been 
broken up and left in place. And um, so that's it for my, that's my acupuncture um, collection. I saw a lot of these cases when I was a fellow in San Francisco. So I, I'll bet you that, that um, Travis has probably seen a bunch um, because acupuncture was, was widely practiced even back then. In that area. So this is a case that I sent to um, some people earlier. This is a case of um, a person who was receiving a platelet transfusion and became uh, short of breath, tachypnic, um, and mildly febrile as the platelet infusion was was finishing, and then had this chest radiograph taken shortly thereafter. And I'll show you that things cleared fairly rapidly because here's a day later, you can see that there's been a lot of clearing of this diffuse lung disease. And here's what it looks like on uh, CT. This is widespread ground glass abnormality, it's somewhat basal predominant, but it's really everywhere. And um, there's an interesting accessory fissure up here. It doesn't have an azygous vein in it. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. So interesting accessory fissure. And then a pattern of diffuse uh, ground glass abnormality with some septal lines. So there's an edema component to this. And this is a uh, transfusion-related acute lung injury. It's a kind of uh, capillary leak generated by platelet transfusion. This person was sensitized by having received multiple platelet tr transfusions in the past, had never had a reaction before, was getting platelets this day. The primary diagnosis in this person is polycythemia vera, and that, that explains the, the splenomegaly and all. But this person was going to have some dental procedures and so got an infusion of platelets going into that and then reacted to it and has this diffuse um, lung injury here. So. This is a kind of capillary leak. It's usually fairly mild. We see a lot of this platelet-induced transfusion reactions or trolley because of our bone marrow transplant population that requires a lot of blood support and uh, platelet support in particular. So this is pretty familiar. And usually this starts clearing up pretty dramatically within a day. It's not really lung injury in the sense of alveolar damage because the fluid that transudes is still uh, low in protein, and so it clears fairly rapidly and often looks just like lung edema with septal lines and accompanying pleural effusions. So you can get um, a capillary leak without a lot of lung damage, and that's usually what these platelet reactions are going to So there's some talk about whether this was the volume of the transfusion, but in, when platelets are transfused, the volume is, is really minuscule, so these people don't get a lot of volume. If you were getting whole blood products, you could get a lot more volume. This person was not anything like that. So this is really a reaction, some sensitization of the platelets and not a volume overload. And finally, um, let me show you this case of really dramatic right lung consolidation, particularly upper lobe in a person with an acute uh, mitral insufficiency. This is one of the most striking examples I've seen of this phenomenon with selective right lung edema because the direction of the regurgitant jet uh, points the, the blood flow blood flow to the upper lobe uh, on the right and the left lung at this point is uh, completely dry looking quite good. There's an accompanying pleural effusion over here. This person got a lot better after the mitral valve was replaced. Okay. That's dramatic. That's a really nice case. Wow. Is Jeff back? He had sent a message saying he might have to step away for a moment. Um, I guess I'm going to take control then. Travis, do you uh, have you seen acupuncture needles yeah. left behind like this? Yeah, we've seen a few. I hadn't seen a lot until you pointed out when you showed a case a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we see them every once in a while. Brent, do you have stuff you want to show? Uh, yes. All right. And uh, Travis, have you seen pneumothorax from acupuncture? No. No, that's certainly a new one. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if I can, yeah, here we go. Make, make you presenter. Let's see. Yeah, those are, David, those are great cases. So. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, this is just a, uh, quick case. This is a, um, 42, uh, year old man, um, obviously has an ascending aortic aneurysm here. 
and coming down, you can see that there's ab an abnormal aortic valve. Um, the aortic valve is thickened and has some calcification here. And um, you can see that it, it doesn't quite have the appearance um, of a uh, congenital bicuspid valve. So I'll show you how the um, re reformats look here. And let me see if I can show this a quick time player. Okay. And here I've just to save time, I've reformatted this and made a movie. And you can see that um, this is a um, unicuspid aortic valve. And you can see that this is the unicomestrial form uh, with a single commissure here. Uh, the valve is obviously thickened and um, calcified here. And you can just sort of make out some of the, the raffes here. Um, but uh, here's the, the commissure, single commissure. And, uh, you know, these, these tend to develop aortic stenosis um, uh, relatively early. And um, the, uh, I don't know if, um, I don't have an example of the, uh, looking for an example, but of the acommissural form where you just have sort of a uh, focal opening in a membrane. But I don't know if, uh, Travis, do you happen to have one of those? Um, <laughs> nope. Okay, um, but I'm guessing that they just present so early that that's why we don't see them. But, uh, but yeah, just a nice example of a new cuspid aortic valve. And the interesting thing is this was on a TAVI planning CT. So the question was, you know, could they possibly do TAVI here or would placing a valve over this, would that in some way rupture this and would that be just a mess? But apparently um, they're going to go ahead and do it. That apparently, uh, you know, um, uh, this can be done and they have uh, done it before. They're going to go ahead and do do a tabby on this so um so we used to be they used to uh kind of have a preference of not doing a lot of bicuspid and unicuspid valves but um now you know more and more they're doing uh tabbies here at least in, in those valves so brant is this associated with an aortopathy like a bicuspid valve in, um you know see? the uh it's interesting because the you know the quadricuspid valves are not um um, the the unicuspid valves, I I think they they can be. Um, so you it's know, a big ascending aorta here. Yeah, this one has, does you know de facto. I mean, there's a big ascending aorta here, so I think that they can be. Now the, the quadricuspid valves, you know, they're more assist, less associated with the aortopathy and um, you know with stenosis, and and most of those have um, regurg. But um, but yeah, the unicuspid valves. You know, looking at this, I mean, you <laughs> have to assume that some of this is not only due to you know stenotic jet, but also due to an aerotopathy. So, but yeah, I'll get back to you on the precise answer there. <laughs> um, okay, good. So uh, here's I have a couple of cases of um, a certain theme here. So let me let me uh, pull up the. Okay, so I think you can see that. Okay, so um, this patient, I'll show you the lungs of this patient uh, first, and let me get this bench here. And you can see that there is, um, you know, a lot of uh, ground glass opacity here, some uh, pleural fusions, um, and just kind of a, you know, a, an appearance that suggests either um, a um, edema or perhaps something else is going on. I'll show you something. Um, let me look at, let's see. Actually, that was the wrong one. Let me show you this one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Because what I really want to show you is um, I want to show you uh, that here there are silicone breast implants here. And I'll show you two different time points. This is the later time point. And when I saw this, um, I, you know, I immediately start searching for internal mammary uh, lymph nodes in, in patients who've had, um, you know, prior, um, you know, breast procedures. And I'm thinking, you know, could they have had uh, breast cancer? And we see that they're enlarged um, internal mammary lymph nodes here. Uh, you also see that they're enlarged um, axillary lymph nodes. And some of the mediastinal lymph nodes are just minimally enlarged here. And, but I'll show you uh, one from 2006. Um, let me make sure that's the right one. Yeah, okay. And we had all the lung findings, but we also have um, enlarged lymph nodes here as well. The internal mammary lymph nodes were also enlarged back here, um, and here and here, and also the axillary lymph nodes were enlarged. And not only that, but these lymph nodes are somewhat high attenuation. If you measure these, these are about 50 or 60 Hounsfield units. 
And these were biopsy, and these were just the case of um, silicone um, uptake within uh, left node. So these were stable in size and high attenuation and biopsy actually several times because people were concerned about these. And this was just um, silicone uh, nodal uptake. <clears throat> so does that occur even if the um, implant is intact and hasn't ruptured? Um, I, I've seen several cases where I couldn't, I looked on that last case and I couldn't see any evidence of, of rupture and I have seen that in just in, in cases where we didn't have rupture at all of the, the implant. So I'm not sure what the mechanism is, I mean maybe just a microscopic leak or um, maybe in some way there's some permeability, but um, I have seen that uh, before. I don't know, if, have other people seen that before? Or? <laughs> Yeah, there must be some leak, either that or they had a revision, because that's not their original implant. Yeah, yeah. So because here I, I didn't see, you know, I could argue, is there a little stranding here? But there was nothing I could really point to as a definite extra capsular leak here. But but just that that interesting case. Let me let me show you this one. This one is a more dramatic case. And um, I'll show you the uh, the long images first. I think I showed this a long time ago, but I don't think Travis was on the call. So I'm just gonna show this again. Um, and you can see here the, um, <clears throat> I'll show you the lungs. And the lungs have this ground glass capacity that's fairly peripheral with associated um, nodules um, at the lung periphery, kind of branching nodular at the lung periphery. Uh, this patient was acutely short of breath. Um, and she'd had a procedure done um, just several days uh, prior. And I'll show you what the um, kernels look like of her um, thigh tissue. And you know, this dramatic uh, bilateral um, reaction, the stranding nodularity, um, multiple you know, nodules here. And so this is a, a massive case of um, silicone um, reaction, silicone pneumonitis caused by, uh, you know, tons of silicone uh, injection into the, the thigh tissue here and, and the buttocks. So like one of the most dramatic cases I've, I've seen um, with a silicone uh, pneumonitis, silicone embolization. Yeah, she went, she went serious there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was, I was, I was following this case up and, and, and you know, doing doing okay now. So, you know, a couple of years after this happened, but, um, you know, I just ran into this, this patient's uh, follow-up scans a bit ago and I decided to bring, bring, bring her back. Wow. So, just a dramatic case of silicone embolization and pneumonitis. And uh, let me, let me show you this case and then I just have one more and that's it. So um, this, this is a case that was billed as a, um, Marfan syndrome, and you can see that there were the aortic root here measured about four or maybe 4.1, um, and you know, um, going down the dramatic finding in the abdominal CT was this um, dissection. Uh, and however, it doesn't, you know, this is obviously not the typical appearance of a standard uh, dissection due to hypertension. Um, you know, smoking and so forth. Uh, it starts in the um, inferior abdominal aorta. Uh, that's always a sign that prep, you know, this is definitely not a typical dissection. And then you have these multiple channels and um, you have, you know, just aneurysmal iliacs here. But look up here at the chest. So for a Marfan's patient, I was skeptical of this diagnosis because there's no pectus. Um, the, the scan doesn't look particularly Marfanoid. Um, and then let's, let's come up here so you can see that um, the vertebral arteries, look at those aneurysms of the vertebral arteries, and mm -hmm. there's this kind of tor corkscrew-like appearance, this torturosity of the vertebrals, um, leading us to consider Lois Dietz uh, syndrome. So in looking at the chart, realize that there was a genetic note saying that, you know, this indeed is a case not of Marfan's but of Lois Dietz syndrome. And apparently, the interesting thing about this case is that there's an um, here to phone for undescribed uh, variant, uh, genetic variant um, uh, of, a, I believe, the SMAD3 gene um, that's like a VUS variant, V O U S variant. So apparently, this was a patient with uh, Lois Dietz who had just a very rare variant. Um, so, and of course, the significance for us was that, you know, they'll replace the aortic root at 
uh, smaller diameters, you know, uh, getting to be 4.5 centimeters, um, uh, you replace it earlier than you would for Marfan syndrome. So just a nice case of Lewis Dietz showing, you know, the tortuosity and vertebral artery aneurysms in addition to the other findings that suggest that this is a systemic, uh, you know, condition rather than a um, just a simple detection caused by uh, atherosclerotic disease. And, and this is a young patient anyway, so this I think is a 24-year-old patient. So. So just very dramatic findings of Lois Dietz syndrome. Yeah, gosh. And, and then just this last one, this is uh, one of my favorites here. And uh, this is a from a scan done for follow-up of this dramatic abnormality um, after uh, a, this was a tetralogy repair. And you can see um, part of the, uh, you know, the, the patch there and they remolded the outflow of the RVOT and then look at the dramatic pseudoaneurysm there of the the anterior ascending aorta and, and there's another one there so you know uh two cannulation site pseudoaneurysms you know as you as you expect for placement of the arterial cannula and the cardioplegia cannula and the ascending aorta uh, but that's not all i thought that was all and then uh uh art stillman called me and said oh did you see the blah 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 abnormality here and uh, this was even one of, I, I haven't seen it all before, but here's the RCA and look where it's running. It's running um, right, you know, through, looks like right through the right atrium. So, um, you know, we, we see these intracavitary courses of the um, LED commonly through the right ventricle, but um, this is the first one I've seen, you know, running through the, um, the, the right atrium. So, you know, just right smack there. So intracavitary course of the RCA through the uh, right uh, atrium. Um, and then Nick uh, Goyle said that he had seen a couple of those before. So, you know, so they must be out there, but <laughs> that was the first one I've seen. So just a dramatic Jeff. case for a couple different reasons. Yeah. Jeff, you showed one, didn't you? Somebody did. But that's Somebody showed one? Yeah, I, showed, a couple years yeah, ago. I showed one, gosh, a few years ago. We had one that passed yeah. the right atrium. Okay, okay. I should have seen that one, but yeah. <laughs> well, obviously in this patient, it's very important if they're going to have endovascular intervention and they're going to have catheters in that right heart, you would have, are there any yeah. case reports of them being injured during intervention? I, I don't know. I mean, I would have suspected this one would be yeah. prone because of so many things going through the right heart, you know, potentially. So, you know, um, I, I haven't specifically investigated that, but it, I would think that you there would, would be. So. so, yeah. Anyway, those are my cases this week. Now, what about the uh, the pseudoaneurysms? That's from oh, so from so these, the uh, cannulation in what context? Uh, well, from you know, presumably from uh, when they did the um, repair of the um, this was the tetralogy repair. So they would have so uh, on cardiopulmonary bypass, and okay. so you know, presumably these are the uh, you know expected locations. So I think it was because of that that particular, uh, you know, cardiopulmonary bypass that they did. Because there are two, and, you know, you would expect, you know, two cannulas there, so. Is the and one then, very wide-mouthed, which seems a bit odd or not? No, it is It is odd. I mean, you know, you, you do want to consider, uh, you know, mycotic uh, uh, causes infection. But um, to my knowledge, this, this patient did not have symptoms, um, you know, of uh, infection. Um, so, um, I mean, I'll, 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 you know, give you the follow-up and, and see what they did with these and if they found anything else, but, um, you know, they're both ascending aorta and the sites that you expect to have cannulation. It, it looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy face right there. It's a bit, it's round with a big hat on it right there. Wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> There's a pseudo in here, so it looks yeah. like the Pillsbury Doughboy. It does. Oh, this one. Yeah, what, right. He's got, it looks like he's the... The round face with the big hat on top, right there. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Travis. Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you still in charge? Are you still running? No, uh, Jeff. I'm back. Jeff's back. It's Jeff. Can I show? Can I show? Boy, oh, boy. Boy. It's a Farina for thorax. <laughs> what? All right. Jeff. Yeah. Can I, I show Travis. one more case here? It's um. Following up on what Brentia showed uh, in the Louis Dietz case, can you put me back on? Yep. So, um, 
so Brent was talking about pectus and Marfan. So here's a person who has Louis Dietz and has this pectus um, carinatum defect of the sternum. I showed this a few weeks ago because of the sternum, but I didn't show you the the uh, vascular finding in this person, which actually was lethal. So this person has a tortuous splenic artery here and then has this splenic artery aneurysm, which had grown compared to a previous um, CT scan and ruptured and caused death in this person. So this uh, Louis Dietz case with a funny, a funny location for an aneurysm, in this case, a splenic artery aneurysm that was lethal. So I guess they have a vasculopathy and and is this known to occur splenic artery aneurysms as well as the vertebral, strange vertebral findings that you may get? When I read about it, you know, these cases are pretty rare. When I read about it, there's a, a variety of, of vessels, sometimes small vessels yeah. are involved in this condition. I, and there are different, as Brent was talking about, there, there are different genotypes here with different distributions of vasculopathy. Oh, wow. Okay, over and out. All right. Thanks, David and Travis. Okay, really quick, I'm going to save Jeff some time here. I just pulled up one of my old talks on where I talked about bullet embolization. And this was a case I saw at the VA a couple of years ago. And whenever there's a bullet, just like in David's case, I always tell the resident, you know, don't assume the patient was shot in the chest, especially if they don't have any other signs of being shot. And what's interesting about this is this patient, you know, a vet who'd been shot a while ago, and I don't know if it was in combat or something else, probably not, just based on the shape of the bullet. But these were at different time points, a few years apart. And notice the orientation of the bullet. It's flipped in the pulmonary artery. So in these, you know, and he was asymptomatic. They didn't do anything about this. But I just thought it was cool that it kind of, you know, it is in the left pulmonary artery and just had rotated, you know, now it's pointing the opposite direction. So I think as opposed to David's case, where it sounds like it got lodged and actually caused ischemia, this is just kind of floating in his pulmonary artery. So I thought yeah, that was kind of cool. Yeah. And now this one, this case I've been saving for a while, and this one's for David as well. Our, uh, we'll visit the diaphragm today since we haven't talked about it. But this is a remarkable one I saw a couple months ago, end of August. I saw this follow-up. And this is a patient who's 65. He has dermatomyositis and had some weight loss and maybe some B symptoms. And I think he had a monoclonal gammopathy. And so they did a whole body PET just um, kind of looking for malignancy. Of course, patients with dermatopolymyositis have an increased risk of, of cancer. And the, we weren't involved in the interpretation of this study. But if you'll notice his diaphragm, especially posteriorly, looks awfully hypertrophied here got a big spleen at this time too. And when I fuse it with the, now I have no idea why it's giving me a disclaimer there, but you can see that there is pretty substantial uptake in the diaphragm. So it's thickened with increased uptake. And I think when, you know, if you're not familiar with this, you can see the SUV is as high as like five in the diaphragm. But the person who read this was bothered by it and said that this might be a cancer of the diaphragm, which I think everybody on this call knows is probably not the case in, in, in this instance. Uh, there was nothing else to suggest malignancy in him. And so they elected to follow him up. The pulmonologist didn't really, I don't think, buy that as well. You can see he's, he's a little thick in here. This was in 2016, so like a year later, not nearly. It, well, it's still similar. And then I was going to show you, he, they, did a, a, um, they did a SNP test as well. And you can see he has maybe a little bit of limited motion, but the diaphragm is still functioning. And I think that he sniffs in here somewhere. Yeah, the, I don't know, well, maybe I didn't save the right one. But anyway, they did a repeat pad and this is when they showed it to me. And of course now he doesn't really have that much uptake in it. And it's, it's still, you know, it's not much above blood pool at this point. So I just, was curious. I mean, we've obviously seen cases of diaphragmatic hypertrophy. I mean, my theory was just that he must have had increased work of breathing at the time of that other pet, which increased the uptake. I mean, of course, I when I saw this with the pulmonologist, I said this is just you know that 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 was probably just what the cause of his increased uptake was. I'm curious if anybody else has seen that. 
or if you have any other explanations. Because, oh, this, one other thing I was going to say is I think a lot of his intercostal muscles, maybe with his dermatopolymyositis and, you know, some of his paraspinal muscles look atrophied. So I bet it's compensatory. But I don't know, David or anyone? So uh, two things. One is, uh, does he have lung fibrosis that might increase the work of breathing? No, he doesn't. He, he, um, he had small effusions on that first study, but he does not have the, the typical connective tissue disease associated fibrosis that we see. Okay. Do you think that uh, that this is the dermatomyositis with muscle involvement involving diaphragm muscle, and that's why the muscle is swollen? Yeah, I don't. That's a very good question. If it's actively inflamed muscle as opposed to, you know, hypertrophy. Right. I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I was just thinking that his intercostal muscles looked a little you know, maybe a little thinner than they should, and maybe a little bit of paraspinal muscle atrophy. And you see a lot more fat than we normally do for a man who's middle age, but I don't know. That's a good thought. Yeah, if it's just diaphragmatic inflammation. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I don't think it's, I don't think anybody would really consider this to be, you know, would think about cancer in this case when it's so symmetric and it's just the muscle. Right. So, but, um, you know, we've seen, I've seen some cases of, um, what I thought were myositis, and the diaphragm muscle had normal thickness, but the function was way off. So, you know, I was looking for atrophy, uh, you know, some phrenic nerve problem, and instead of atrophy, there was normal thickness, but the function was was off. So one of those was a person with graft versus host disease, and had a lot of muscle involvement elsewhere, hmm. and the, the you know the the muscle was not thin, but the diaphragm was barely moving. So. I think that you can have normal thickness. To, to me, now normal thickness but poor function raises the question of some sort of myopathy. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good thought. I, I mean, I don't think we'll ever know, but it, it was just. I just thought it was pretty cool just seeing that much uptake in the diaphragm and have it that hypertrophied. Spectacular. So, all right, Jeff. All take right. Take you a couple of minutes here. Thanks. That's a cool case. Uh, Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Oh boy, which one is this? Do you guys see CT scan? The plural? Good. Okay, so this is a case from Julie. She sent me a while ago that I haven't had a chance to show yet. Um, so this is a guy, um, and let's see, we've got the two different scans here. The one on your right is from uh, the baseline, and this one was done about through three weeks later. And you can see we've got a smoker here. He's got a few little nodules on his original scan. But what's changed is you can see there's diffuse central lobular nodules throughout all the lungs, tree and bud, everywhere. But I think the important finding here, and this is something I know Travis has talked about, I think other people, David as well, um, you know, when you see diffuse tree and bud, we don't often see that with bronchiolitis. Um, it's often patchier or there's some sparing. Um, but you'll notice that the, i me change the window here, that the, there's acute dilation of the right ventricle in this patient with straightening of the septum, even a little bit of bowing maybe. So, so this looks more like a vascular cause of um, pulmonary, of, it looks like acute pulmonary hypertension, but a vascular cause of tree and bud. And this guy was actually injecting uh, uh, heroin intravenous. So this is presumably an arteriopathy and some sort of incipient, um, uh, incipient lung disease here. And that's indeed what this was. And I suspect some of these, these areas that we see on the older scan were probably subacute septic infarcts or septic emboli from earlier. And you can see there's also a little bit of mosaic attenuation, so probably from previous insults there. But quite dramatic change in the course of just a few weeks. But I remembered uh, when I saw this case, remember, I think, it was, I think it was you, Travis, who showed that case. And that was one of the observations made was when you see tree and bud in absolutely every portion of the lung, think of, of IV drug use. Yeah, or even the inhalational stuff. I think we were, yeah, that we were discussing just that it just seems like it's never an infectious bronchiolitis if it's just uniform and involving everywhere. Okay, you That's guys really see it. Thing. Yeah, a baby gram. Yes. All right. So this is a baby gram, but I'm going to start out. So you can, so you'll notice that there's um, an opacified right hemithorax. There, you follow the gastric tube down. Clearly, there's displacement of the mediastinum to the right. I have a fetal MR, but I'm going to leave it out at this point. You, I'll send it to you guys. 
it, it just shows that there's no right lung tissue. Um, and also notice there's only gas on the right. You don't see any bowel gas. This is a preemie. There's no hum uh, humeral heads here. Um, and then here's the bronchoscopy, which I think is really cool. And there's no heart either. Well, yeah, it's hiding. <laughs> so here's the area. I'll just tab through these. So here we're going down towards the uh, carina. And you'll see when we get down there, you see one airway, but you just see a nubbin of the right lung here. So this is consistent with pulmonary aplasia as opposed to agenesis. So there's a small nubbin of, of an airway, but no vasculature. And here is the CT of this baby. And you'll see there's dextra position of the heart. And let's see if I can find that airway. There's the airway. And you can follow it down. And right there's the endotracheal tube. And there's a little airway next to it that just stops blindly. So that's the aplastic, that's the rem remnant of the, the bronchial bud but there's no lung parenchyma on that side. Now it gets more exciting um, because if we go down to the belly, it looks like we have um, sort of a normal abdominal situs. There's spleen on the left, liver on the right, but there's also a malrotation. And you see all the small bowels here on the right. There's the stomach on the left. And I am sure there are more anomalies in here that I've yet to find, or I can remember all the ones I wrote down, but there's lots of them there. Uh, abdominal malrotation, pulmonary aplasia, and other anomalies. But let's see if I can find that. It was kind of cool because this was actually, you know, the, the prenatal ultrasound was abnormal. Now here is uh, a fetal MR image, and you can see, let's see, there's the spinal cord here. So we should be able to see, I can get in the right plane, uh, the absence of lung tissue. Well, um, I think just for time purposes, I'll let you guys look at it yourself if you want, but it only there's a there's one where it's coronal to the baby and you can see there's only one lung so really the only difference between aplasia and agenesis is the uh, presence or absence of a bronchial bud but i they're physiologically identical and so this is aplasia and uh interestingly this one's associated with other anomalies more often than not they occur in isolation so um i think i got time for one quick one and this is nothing fancy but it's probably the best example I've ever seen of endovascular metastases. So this is metastatic renal cell, and you can see there's nodules everywhere. There's lymphadenopathy. But when you get in these large, actually, let me show the older one. I think it's better. Here we go. There you go. The best endo, endovascular metastases I've seen, you've got these dilated vessels. The side branch vessels are dilated. They're branching, and they have this very characteristic shaggy appearance. And it was interesting because I was consulting with a pulmonologist and they thought these were all impacted airways. And they were surprised they didn't find anything when they had bronchs the patient. Um, it's because it's all in the vasculature here. Wow. Mm -hmm. And some of them are venous too. So it's not just arterial, but you know, renal cells, the one that seems to like to do this the most. I have seen hepatocellular, but I think this is the best example I've seen to date. And I mean, he's just, this patient has just a huge burden of disease. You can see there's all this necrotic lymphadenopathy. There's the primary tumor, and it's just, it's everywhere. Okay, well. Yeah, and Jeff, I think that's an important point, too, that you make about the mucus impaction, because oftentimes on the first study, it does look like just a little bit of small airways disease. Yeah. but And then they just persist and grow over time, and then you realize it's next to the airway instead of in it, and you know it's in the artery or the lymphatics. But. And I just, the airways just don't get that shaggy looking. I right. think the cartilage is pretty tough, and it kind of keeps them nice and smooth. Yeah. The, the lumpiness, the beadedness is good for bronchial stuff, but the, the margin is crisper when it's in the bronchus. Yeah. And it's funny, I actually saw three cases of intravascular metastases last week. So I don't know, if, you know I don't know, I just noticed them or something, but I'll, I have some other ones I can share with you if you're interested. But this one was the most, just I think one of the best examples. Well, we are up and running with the new go-to meeting. It's updated on the STR website and... Um, so we will continue on next week. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.